America's Heartland is made possible by... They make up a small part of our population, but have a huge impact on our lives. They take business risks few others would tolerate, all on our behalf. They're American farmers who feed, fuel, and clothe the world. Monsanto would like to recognize them for all they do for the rest of us. Because ultimately, our success and everyone else's depends on theirs. And by the American Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of agriculture. Hi there, I'm Rob Stewart. Coming up, we'll take you to New England, where a very special group of people is preserving part of America's rural heritage by refurnishing and repurposing these century-old barns. I'm Akiba Howard. You know, success in any business depends on energy and innovation. We're here in Nebraska visiting a young farm family whose efforts impact the kind of crops that make their way to your supermarket. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Americans eat more chicken than ever before, so how do producers keep up with the demand? We'll take you inside an Arkansas poultry operation that is pioneering new methods to bring the best birds to market. That's all coming up on America's Heartland. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's Heartland, living close. Close to the land. You know, all too often, city dwellers know very little about what takes place on a farm or ranch. There's really little opportunity. Well, one farm family in Utah is making that connection with a unique combination of ranching and recreation. The stunning views across Park City, Utah speak for themselves. The mountains, the blue skies, the red rock cliffs. Okay, I but rancher Steve Osgathorpe is changing the dialogue about working the land in this outdoor paradise. We saw what was happening in the Park City area. We were either going to have to to get out of agriculture, sell our property and leave, but there was no other place we wanted to go and we didn't want to be driven out. Driven out by tourism. By the early 1990s, this old mining town was becoming a playground for the rich and famous. The Osgathorps didn't know much about outdoor recreation, but they did own tens of thousands of acres here. Horseback riding seemed like a natural pursuit, and word spread. Actors Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy came, as did pro basketball star Carl Malone, and TV news anchors Matt Lauer and Katie Couric during the 2002 Winter Olympics. Left leg in the stirrup there, grab that horn, up and over. The Jenko family came west from Baltimore. I was perfectly content just staying on the East Coast until uh, took a trip out here and I was just, it's breathtaking. I had to get my family out here to come out and see it. But Park City is one of those rare places that offers something year round. Everybody's first time? Uh, no, you've all been before? And it doesn't hurt to be surrounded by two world-class ski resorts either, resorts that also lease their land. We decided we better get in the recreation mode a little and, and determine our destiny. I tell people, instead of milking cows now, we milk the public. The humor is a cover of sorts for the serious work this former dairyman is doing on the environment. It looks like you've done some work up there on that hillside. Yes, this is uh, one of the areas that was in our uh, uh, forestry management plan. Osgathorpe and his six sons are thinning the trees to make way for others, reseeding hillsides and trails, and improving the quality of the runoff that trickles down to his crops every spring. 
When we bought this property, it had been overgrazed and the streams that run out of here in the spring were running dirty and, and we knew there were problems and we wanted to correct those problems because we knew if we took care of it, it would take care of us. And it does. Each fall, the Osgathorps bring in sheep to graze the nearby slopes before ski season. Their flocks get fed and the family makes another buck off the land. 28-year-old Mike does it all, but his primary job is sheep, 4,000 head on various pieces of land throughout Utah. Wool prices are up and down, but lamb consistently fetches top dollar. It's kind of been a way of life. We've been you know, born into it, and some say brainwashed into it. So it kind of gives us all, all the boys and parents, a chance to, to keep it going, keep the family legacy alive. It's a legacy more could emulate. The family also grows barley, alfalfa, corn, and wheat, but they understand enough to leave behind an occasional dead tree. It's habitat restoration for birds. Steve Osgathorpe and his family love this land. And more than ever, they want to make sure it's something future generations can manage, monetize, and enjoy. Our whole goal is to leave this land better than when we found it. Ancient species of horses once roamed the Americas, including Utah, thousands of years ago. Some scientists claim that climate change was the cause of their ultimate extinction. Spanish explorers reintroduced the horse to the Americas in the 16th century. You know, there are any number of success stories in America's heartland, and a lot of them impact the kinds of choices we make when we head to the grocery store. Well, for one farm family, success depends on energy, innovation, and a look to the future. Scott Moore knows that it takes much more than just seed and rain to create the basic ingredient for that loaf of bread on your dinner table. Raising wheat is a year-round effort. His farm makes up just a fraction of the one and three-quarter million acres planted in Nebraska. Working alongside his father, Stan, Scott counts on everyone's help to get the crop to market. Hard work's great. It's been a struggle in certain points, and I'd like the kids to not be able to have to struggle as much as Carl and I have, but I don't want complacency to set in either that it's easy, it's too easy. You want to check the flow meter? Scott, a third generation farmer, is helping his kids, nine year old Katie and 12 year old Zach, learn the farming business on land where his grandfather started back in the 1920s. Over the years, he and his father have amassed a 7,000 acre spread that includes corn, soybeans, winter wheat, and 350 head of cattle. There is no greater compliment to a farmer than to have his son choose to come back on the farm and work with him. We work with each other ultimately about 365 days a year. Is that all we got? Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't look very hard. But maybe some of it there. Running a farming operation these days demands attention to not only crop markets, but energy costs, environmental concerns, sustainable farming practices, and machinery issues. As Scott works the land. Hey, Riley, you got a minute? Yeah. His wife, Carla, works full time 30 miles away as an agent for a farm insurance company. And when that work day is done, She's back home with another set of obligations and challenges for the farm. Lunch is ready, let's go guys. And her family. She gets parts picked up in town, uh, runs after us all the time, helps me irrigate, helps us work cattle, does, does about everything that's possible she can do. Couldn't handle it without her. Carla says helping her husband has become second nature. We can drive down the interstate from here to Lincoln and he can tell me what was planted in every field along the way for the past two to three years. And, you know, so just the agriculture stuff that he has, it's just, it's in his brain, it's just how he's wired. And is that one pretty crunchy? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay, yeah. so this head, this head is ready to go. Okay, So All this right. would be ready to, this would be ready to harvest. To improve his soil and forestall erosion, Scott has implemented a no-till approach planting as he plows under the remains of last year's crop. And if you still look down in the ground here, 
it can still wow. see this is last year's wheat stubble. Right. It right. was standing up here just as tall as we are here. Mm -hmm. And then this is the corn stalk from the year before that. Oh, okay. Just laying all down there. And what we're building, and if we dig a little farther, see all this oh, is Oh, right, right. All this is humus and everything that's on the soil. And that turns into fertilizer and also yeah. If it rains or hard or anything, no erosion. Mm -hmm. No soil's gonna move. It's gonna hit that, bounce off, deflect, and then settle back in. Recognition from your peers is important in confirming that your efforts have made a difference. That recognition came recently as Scott and Carla were picked as the best of Nebraska's young farmers and ranchers. A nod to their efforts in the past and to their plans for their family farm in the future. To put your operation up against other people in the state and for that panel of judges to say, yeah, I think you're the number one this year, you know, that's, it's a great ego boost, but, you know, it's just an amazing honor to be recognized. Nebraska is one of the top agricultural states in the nation, but the state's expansive farmland was not always viewed as productive. Some early European explorers mistakenly considered those wide open spaces as the Great American Desert. I'm Sarah Gardner. Still ahead, we'll take you to an Arkansas poultry operation where producers have designed some new approaches to meet the growing demand. Hi, I'm Rob Stewart. Still ahead, saving America's rural heritage by saving century-old barns one at a time. Hi, I'm Paul Robbins, and here's something you may not have known about agriculture. When it comes to beneficial livestock, you can't do much better than cows. The cud-chewing bovine provides everything from food to fertilizer. Are you up for some ice cream, cheese, maybe some yogurt? Thank a farmer and a cow. But when did this partnership all begin? Well, let's head across the Atlantic. All modern domesticated breeds of cattle descended from wild ox-like animals called aurochs that once roamed over large areas in Asia, Europe, and North Africa. We're talking 30,000 years ago. The aurochs were a favorite animal for hunters since they provided food and hides for clothing and shoes. Fast forward to 6,000 BC and early man started luring wild cattle into communities and domesticating them. Scientists say the herding instincts of the cattle made that easier, along with the natural curiosity of the uh, big bovines. The Fertile Crescent of the Middle East was one of the first regions to benefit from domesticated animals, both for food and as beasts of burden. And from there, the good news, or should that be good moose, thank you, spread across Asia, Europe, and Africa. Africa is still home to a large number of cattle, about 230 million animals. The U.S. has about 100 million cattle, but it's India that leads the cattle count worldwide with about 280 million head. That's a lot of methane. Americans eat more chicken today than ever before. Increased chicken choices at fast food restaurants is part of the reason, but chicken has always been a popular choice for those looking for a low-fat, high-protein meal. And as the demand for chicken grows, so does the need to produce more birds for market. When it comes to poultry, these birds are big business. Chicken is the most popular main dish meal in the world. Poultry production in the U.S. has more than doubled in the past 40 years, generating more than $20 billion annually. The Cobb Vantress Company is one of the world's oldest poultry breeding operations. Their farms here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, have been breeding birds since 1961. Well, first the eggs come into the egg holding room, and they come in in farm racks. That's where we transfer them to incubator racks, and they sit in the incubator for approximately 18 days. After these eggs hatch, the chicks are separated by sex. The males for breeding and the females for broilers. Chickens that end up in the meat department of your supermarket. We want a bird that has good feather cover, uh, high yielding birds, uh, birds that are growing fast, birds that walk very well, that walk very easily, uh, animals that have high degree of fertility and hatchability. So we need birds to be good breeders and also good broilers. Changing consumer tastes, foods with less fat, and increasing choices in ready-to-eat meals have generated a big jump in chicken consumption. The focus here 
is selecting and developing traits that answer the demands of poultry producers and consumers. This could be efficiency, health of the bird. And we try to improve by finding the very best families and the very best individuals each year. Feed accounts for a large portion of the cost in raising chickens. Advances in feeding methods and new grain options are some of the considerations. In 1980, uh, it would take about 2.4 pounds of feed for every pound of chicken that we want to grow. But if you look at the efficiency of a bird today, we're looking at birds that consume only about 1.8 pounds of feed per pound. In addition to consumer concerns about cost and quality, poultry producers here and elsewhere also deal with food safety issues in the health of their birds. Biosecurity is important because uh, we have guaranteed our customers that we're going to provide them with 100% uh, clean bird, uh, and biosecurity is the key to reaching that ultimate goal. Uh, no one is allowed to enter the hatchery without a shower. We can't enter any, any kind of clothes from the outside. We have a complete wardrobe on the inside, shoes, shirt, pants, everything. Encounters with production animals require control methods to keep bacteria and pathogens from coming in contact with the birds. And it's obviously serious business since not only do we have these suits, but we've got booties covering our shoes, we've got hairnets on right down to the gloves. We also have foot pans at each door and hand sanitizers. So if you go outside the hatchery and you come back in, you have to disinfect your shoes and disinfect your hands. It's a known fact that it is, that it is in uh, byproducts, it is in corn, it comes out of fields, salmonella can come from so many different places. So we know that it's coming in. We test for it and we find it. The testers let their feet do much of the work. Their booties pick up bits and pieces of waste and debris from the hatchery. Gathered material is then analyzed. I think through modern technology, probably one of the biggest changes is that we can measure the presence of pathogens probably better than we could many, many years ago. Uh, the laboratories, both the state laboratories uh, in the poultry states and also the in-house laboratories of Cobb are better equipped to, dis to detect pathogens earlier, faster, and therefore we can remediate the situation and keep our flocks healthy. Changes in breeding, along with scientific developments, have dramatically increased the amount of poultry produced for sale in the United States and overseas. As producers here like to say, making a better bird. We try to hatch the best and do the best and be the best. We try to put the customer number one and try to be the best. In some early societies, the chicken was considered a sacred animal symbolizing the sun and certain breeds were developed to provide plumage for ceremonial costumes. My name is Patrick Weddle, and uh, an en entomologist is a person who studies insects. My particular specialty is um, is crop protection entomology with an emphasis in biological control, um, using natural systems to assist in the, in the uh, control of insects in agricultural crops, particularly orchard crops. What I have done in the course of my career as an entomologist is work with farmers uh, to determine what the most appropriate ways of managing the pest populations in their orchards would be. So with this, I can look at leaves and shoots from the tops of the trees. You're engaged in trench warfare when you're working in, in this kind of an environment, managing pests um, on a, uh, on a uh, daily basis. But it's very rewarding. We get to see results of our, of our work. There are a lot of things that, uh, that entomologists can be proud of. So we're using pheromones to monitor the insect, and we're using pheromones to disrupt their mating and the result has been a further reduction in pesticide use uh, to the extent where many orchards aren't even spraying on an annual basis anymore for codling moth. Those of us who are crop protection entomologists, uh, this is kind of what we do. We're, we're resource managers, uh, we're, we're applied environmentalists, we're, we're working with growers in order to help them to be more efficient because if they're more efficient, they're more economically competitive. Uh, insects have been around for uh, 
hundreds of millions of years. Uh, they were here long before our species was, and uh, they'll probably be here long after our species is gone. So yeah, we have to learn to live with them, and, and indeed in many respects we have, to the extent that we can uh, learn to, to be compatible with them. Uh, ultimately, it, it will enhance our ability to succeed as a, as a species. There are just some things that are iconic when it comes to America's history, and that includes these beautiful century-old barns that used to cover the rural landscape. Well, many of these barns are gone now because of the ravages of time, but thanks to a very special group of people, some of these barns are taking on a new life. They are rugged symbols of the nation's agricultural roots, essential pieces of architecture around which rural daily life was centered. The barn is a masterpiece sitting out there. Ken Epworth is known best as the barn man. He scours New England for century-old structures that have outlived their usefulness. Unrestored, they would eventually crumble to the ground. But Ken and his crew dismantle them beam by beam. At his shop in Windsor, Vermont, he then reconditions them for a new use in a new location. There's backyard offices, there are art studios, there's stores, there are bars, there's restaurants, there's swimming pools in them. 250 years ago, there were thousands of dairy farms and their requisite barns all across Vermont. Most of those post and beam barns, some dating back to the 18th century, are obsolete on today's modern farms and the sheer cost of maintenance is often prohibitive. So rather than lose these pieces of history, Ken and his crew restore them. Most of this wood is anywhere from two to 500 years. Wow. Uh, we, it really depends on when the barn was built. What a preservation of history. But it, uh, it, the wood just doesn't come like this anymore. You can't, can't duplicate it. Uh, one of the, the, the real nice things about working with old barn timbers is that they're done drying and they're done twisting and warping. Ken's company has renovated more than 600 barns in his 35 years in business. Some still see duty as agricultural structures, but more and more of them have become homes. One of the dead giveaways on barns versus homes is windows, fenestration. A barn typically doesn't have but one or two windows up high that are just letting light in because it's a storehouse for grain. And they couldn't afford glass when they built these things initially. Barns like these can awaken a community spirit. This land in California's Napa Valley was settled as a farmstead in the 1880s. The current owners at the Nickel and Nickel Winery went looking for other buildings to complement the property's historic home. One of Ken's barns was a perfect fit. It was a barn that was starting to rot away, was in danger of being burned down by the owners, and in fact it was built in 1770, so before the Declaration of Independence, and now has a new life being the headquarters of our offices for making wine. But history has its price. Restoring a barn can run about $75 a square foot, and that's before shipping and reassembly. The winery structure took four weeks to construct once it reached the site. Every single piece was numbered. Uh, they do it with little uh, tags, paper tags, and I actually left one or two of the tags on in the building just sort of to remind us. And then it just goes together like a jigsaw puzzle. For many people, barns like these mean more than simply space and storage. It's a chance to step back in time and sense the history of a different age. There are certain things you have to experience, and walking into the barn and the hand-hewn nature of it, the warmth of it, the proportions of it, that's what seduces everybody who goes into these places. But relocation has its critics. Some say the renovation and reciting of these barns steal something from the original landscape. As we go inside, you can see we did everything we could in order to preserve the feel, while at the same time in the world of preservation, what you really want is a new and vibrant use for a structure so that it can continue to survive. Ken Upworth sees more barns for renovation on the horizon, often racing the elements of wind, water, and weather before they fall to the ground. 
I'm barn man, that's what I do. I get up in the morning, my feet hit the floor, and I'm ready to go take it on. I eat it, I sleep it, and that, that's it. And I've always loved my work. I couldn't have picked a better career. And that's gonna do it for us this time. Thank you for traveling the country with us on this edition of America's Heartland. We're always pleased that you can join us. And remember, there's a lot more on America's Heartland at our website, including videos from the stories on today's show. Just log on to americasheartland.org and we'll see you next time right here in America's Heartland. To order a copy of this broadcast, visit us online or call 1-888-814-3923. The cost is $14.95 plus shipping. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's heartland, living close, close to the land. America's Heartland is made possible by... They make up a small part of our population, but have a huge impact on our lives. They take business risks few others would tolerate, all on our behalf. They're American farmers who feed, fuel, and clothe the world. Monsanto would like to recognize them for all they do for the rest of us. Because ultimately, our success and everyone else's depends on theirs. And by the American Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of agriculture.